pushing my boundaries has changed my life. Now I'm on a mission to help five people change theirs. I'm Ben Fogel, and this is Extreme Dreams. This week, we're trekking across a country with mountains so high, they're permanently shrouded in cloud and ice. Where sheer cliffs fall thousands of feet into deep, scorching valleys. We'll have to cope with freezing weather one minute and searing heat the next. Welcome to the High Andes, the wild, desolate mountain range that forms the backbone of Peru in South America. We're on our way to a lost Inca city, often described as the sister of Machu Picchu. But getting to Choquicarao is going to be the challenge of our lives. We'll be battling across 200 miles of the world's most treacherous terrain, using a route so dangerous only 100 people have used it in the last century. We'll need to trek at high altitude, ride horses along narrow mountain passes, cross raging rivers, and survive out in the wilderness. The five wannabe explorers who've signed up for the trip have no idea what's in store. London-based Mia has just turned 40 and is a full-time mum to her three children. I'm not superwoman, but I do a good impression. <laughs> Francesca works in a Brighton call centre and models part-time. I'm very energetic. I've got a lot of energy, too much energy a lot of the time, and if you can't release that, you get kind of, it transfers to sort of anger and frustration, you get very agitated. Events manager Mark lives in Wimbledon and is a self-confessed control freak. I'm a perfectionist. There you go, I said it, yeah. Um, I think that everything has a place and it should be in its place. Single mum Shelley has lived her whole life on the same South London estate and is desperate to get out and experience more of the world. I want to see me do stuff I've never done before. I want to see how far I can take myself without me breaking down and screaming, oh my God, what have I done? So I want to see how many days it takes me to say that. At 55, Howard from Leeds is the oldest member of the team. He's a market trader by day and stand-up comedian by night. If my wife worried about me going, uh, now she's checked the policies, I think she'll be still there waving me away. Five very different people, but they all have one thing in common. They want to prove themselves on Extreme Dreams. Our adventure starts with a 24-hour, 5,000-mile journey to the city of Cuzco, deep in the heart of the Andes. As soon as we land, it's straight onto the bus for a marathon eight-hour drive to the start of the Choquicarao Trail. Aha, room for one more? <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. Coming up on day one of our trek to the lost city, we find there's only one way across a raging river. Oh, Mom. Oh. We get stuck into our hike, and the insects get stuck into us. I'm just going to show you um, my hand. Look at that one and compare it to that one. But none of us are expecting what we're about to receive. Oh, it's got the <laughs> candle. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm a vegetarian. Thousand foot drops, hairpin bends, and lorry drivers on the wrong side of the road soon turn this journey into an ordeal. It's just unbelievable because every corner you turn, there's a massive, massive drop. It's all bumpy in that end. For Shelley, who's terrified of heights, it's a white knuckle ride. <sighs> like these ain't even proper roads. And we're like right really close to the edge. And there's no like bars or anything. Shelley lives on the ninth floor of a tower block, despite suffering from chronic vertigo. Never used to be scared of heights, but sometimes when I go on my balcony, just get into the wall of the balcony and looking over, I get all like, oh, and I feel like the balcony's gonna drop and I'm gonna fall. Shelley had her daughter Paris at 19 and is a full-time mum. It's an exciting life because I have a little girl. She makes it exciting. She's five and it's called Paris. And she's amazing, she's funny. She does um, ballet and tap and sings all little Annie songs and that. It's hard to leave Paris behind, but Shelley knows she's in good hands. I am going to miss her. I'm going to miss her loads. 
Um, but she does go on holiday with my mum and dad every year, so I suppose I'm going to miss her like I miss her when she goes on holiday. Shelley's hoping this trip will kickstart her life and give her the confidence to try new things. Sometimes I feel like I'm just left behind. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I feel like um, there's so much more I can show people and I can do, but it's like I can't get there or it's never gonna, I'm never going to get there, them kind of feelings. A hair-raising eight hours later, we reach the start of the trail. I bet you're all glad to get off that, um, that bus. Yeah. Well, guys, this is the end of the road as far as the, um, the truck goes, but the beginning of our adventure. We're off to a place called Choki Karao, which is basically, it's often described as the, the sister ruin to Machu Picchu. It's almost as spectacular, but the brilliant thing about it is that no one ever goes there. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's not going to be easy. Pepe, you're leading. Shall we, um, shall we begin the journey? Sure. <laughs> Pepe is a trained paramedic. He's going to guide us across this treacherous wilderness. This is the Urubamba River. It stands between us and the start of the Chokikarao Trail. There's no bridge for 50 miles, so there's only one way across it. We're going to be strapped into a basket and flung across a high wire. There's a terrifying couple of hundred feet between us and the water. Vamanos. Right. This isn't good news for Shelley. It's the worst I can't do it. In my head, it's like, I can't do this. And I probably get one split second of fall. I want to get the hell out of here. You look a bit worried. Well, it looks like it's falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, interesting. <laughs> not a fan of heights, not a fan of water, but, you know, we'll get there. It's the first challenge, so uh, I guess one should uh, give it everything, so we'll see. Events manager Mark likes everything just so. I do tend to live by a certain way that, you know, I feel it's the way it should be done. Um, very rarely matters what <laughs> other people think. Like my house, I, I like to be a particular way. I don't like it to have bits of it that are too messy or too cluttered. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite anal about a lot of things. But at 35, Mark's decided that it's time to take a few risks and let his hair down. What I want from this trip is to prove to myself that being adventurous isn't necessarily something to be scared of. Not being in control is actually a positive thing, and perhaps flying by the seat of your pants should be done once in a while. Pepe, you're our safety man, aren't you? You're going to... All right. You're going to be fixed on the basket, so don't worry about it. It'll be safe, OK? But if you fall, Look at the river. You're not going to be able to tell the story to anybody. Oh, OK? Therefore, we have this. And you're going to be I'm first. Gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to volunteer to go okay. first. Wish me luck. Have a good ride. Bye-bye. Oh, this is one scary ride. The basket's flimsy, and it sways like crazy. This is going to be a real struggle for Shelley. Yes, there we go, one down, five to go. Shelley's the next to go. Is it really, really tight? Really tight. As tight as you can do it. <laughs> All I kept thinking was, how long has this been here for? And does anybody maintain it? Does anybody go to check and see if it's OK? Oh, Mum. <laughs> Just say if something happens. What my, my mum and my daughter are at home, and if anything happened to me, I've left them behind. I was just, I was just loads of emotions and thoughts were going through my mind, and all I could think was, I want to get to the other side, I want to get to the other side. If Shelley's this frightened at this height, I'm not sure how she'll cope when she sees the thousand foot drops on the mountain paths ahead of us. Well done. You okay? I do not want to do that again. Was it as bad as you expected it to be? Or was it? <laughs> when well, you're left in the middle and it's just swinging and don't like none of that. Mia's next, and she looks like she's up for any challenge we can throw at her. Highly independent, 
Mia's been a single mum for the last three years and has got used to doing pretty much everything for herself. I'm strong and independent. I feel that vulnerability is a weakness, you know, so it's, it's kind of almost a mask and it's a choice where I'm going to, what I'm going to be. And I choose the, um, the strong, independent one. And failure is not an option. I have to get to the top to the end. I have to find it in me to get there. And that's what you need, you know, that stamina. Mia's dying for a chance to break out of her normal routine. I guess I'm rediscovering myself, really, because uh, I gave up a, a lot when you have children. Kind of didn't look in a mirror for about seven years. Uh, you, like, you build up brick walls in your mind to, to stop you doing things. Um, and I just feel that this will break down that brick wall and everything will be within my reach. Francesca and Howard make it over safely. Last to come over is Mark, but he seems to have hit a snag. I hadn't worked out, actually, that you were supposed to grab the rope after each of the little parts it was attached to. And, of course, I had just been pulling the rope in my kind of slight panic to get across. And so as the rope's coming through all these things, they're just all snapping. And um, I had loads of rope in with my day pack around my legs. So, I mean, falling out just wasn't an option at this point. I probably would have hung myself. The rope unravels and the basket runs backwards, out of control. Oh, no, he let go of the rope. I think he did, didn't he? He's actually um, broken it. We're just done doing the knot. Whilst I try and fix the pulley, Mark's left dangling above the raging waters. You're really aware that below you is all this fast flowing water. You're not really held in by anything. And I thought death slide. 20 minutes later, we managed to re-thread the rope and pull Mark to safety. Now it's time to start the next stage of our journey, a three mile hike to the village of Cobos and our beds for the night. So Pepe, who should lead? As usual. I do. You do, and then is it, do we have to choose a specific order or does it not matter? Mm, it doesn't matter. I heard a story that the second person is the one that snakes go for because you disturb the first one. It can one. happen, yeah. Sometimes Might you not get a second. we do encounter snakes. <laughs> but that you are. Sometimes <laughs> we do encounter spectral little bears, but you know, they're not really dangerous unless you don't bother them. You know, if they have a family, they will protect them. Okay. All right? Do you hear that, everyone, so, then? Just leave bears alone. <laughs> yeah. They look cute, but you're not supposed to pet them. All right? Okay. Here, take my hand there. Three hours of trekking later, we arrive at the hostel. This is going to be our last chance for some home cooking, a warm bed and flushing toilets for the next ten days. Put the sopa es? Uh, crema de choclo. Mm. Esparragus. Oh, 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 who's a, who's a, um, a good cook here? I am absolutely useless, Are totally you? and utterly em embarrassed to say uh -huh. I am useless. But my wife's got a black belt in cookery. One of her chops and you're dead, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Howard is an old hand at cracking jokes. Good evening. Well, isn't it lovely to have a warm hand on your opening? Back home in Yorkshire, Howard regularly raises money for a children's hospice. I got down the A1 and the police car pulled me, said, you know you're doing 80 mile an hour, sir? I says, uh, I didn't realise this yet. We've been following you for two miles, sir. He says, didn't you see our blue flashing light in the rear view mirror? I said, I did. He says, well, why didn't you stop? I says, well, 20 years ago, my wife ran off with the policeman. I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> my personality um, is up for anything. Give me a crowd of people and I'll stand up and be the number one entertainer. Howard has worked as a market trader with barely a break for 40 years. I worked on the market since I was 15 years of age. My father died at 47. Uh, I was just leaving school and I was thrown into a market business. Because of that, I missed a lot of my younger teenage years because I was working every day on the market. All my pals, why aren't you coming out Saturday night? Can't, I'm up Sunday morning for the market. 
I felt very, very passionate that my father built a business and he wanted me to carry it on. Lovely. Yeah, there's some digestive biscuit, 200 gram, which will be all right. For you. This could be the very thing that I've been waiting for. Yes, it could open the door to my future as far as finding the real me. I never have time to do what I want to do. It's my time. It's quality time for Howard. We're having a party. Well, I think I could curl up here. And so could I. <laughs> You'll be first in for breakfast as well. Yeah, that's very true, actually. That's a good idea, isn't it? Well, today was definitely a tough one for all the guys out here, but I was really impressed at how they all pulled through it. I think Shelley and Howard um, are going to be on cracking form again and uh, are going to jolly us along. And Mark and Mia are sort of keeping themselves to themselves. I think that um, we're going to have a couple of people struggling, perhaps, by tomorrow. I'm not sure necessarily who, but I think I might put my money on Francesca. Um, she was struggling a little bit today, and we've got an even bigger day ahead of us. Francesca claims not to have done any training for this trek. Probably eat too many pizzas to be doing this. <laughs> I had a pizza last night and I was on a diet, so it's not really working very well. Um, I don't think I'm unhealthy, very unhealthy. I do try to keep fit. I go to the gym now and again. <laughs> Part-time modelling is one of the ways that Francesca helps herself to cope with a hyperactivity disorder. If she isn't kept constantly stimulated, she's prone to angry outbursts. In the past, this has made it difficult for her to make new friends and work in a team. I think this trip's going to help me because it's going to make me spend time with people and make me rely on people instead of going, well, don't like any of you lot, I'm going through my own thing, because you're just not going to be able to do that there, are you? Francesca wants to prove that she can do a trek like this, despite her problems. I'm excited about the challenges. I think there's some parts where I'm going to be on the top of the world because it is going to be really busy and really exciting and new things all the time, and that's um, me at my best when I'm like that. But it's also going to be no plans. I'm not going to know what's going to do. I'm not going to be in control. And I think I'm going to find that quite stressful. Coming up on day two of our trek to the lost city, we go up and the rain pours down as we begin our steep climb to Chokikarao. The team begin to feel the strain, and as darkness falls, we still haven't got anywhere to sleep. Oh, I'm not sleeping on that. At last, the real journey begins. We finally leave civilization behind, and from now on, everything we need must be carried with us. We're picking up a team of mules, led by their Peruvian wranglers. The mules will carry all our food, clothes and tents. Today, we face a 10-hour trek to our first camp, high in the Andes. It's a massive nine-mile hike uphill. When we get there, we'll be nearly 4,000 metres above sea level. As we climb higher, the landscape changes and so does the weather. I think all of us, you know, no matter how much you like the outdoors, it's a little bit of a downer. So I think everyone's just trudging on today. When we did the first walk, I was knackered in about seven minutes. I couldn't breathe. And it was all uphill, and I thought, I'm going to die on this trip, I think. Only 700 yeah. miles to go, yes. we'll be there too. <laughs> oh, but if it's all like this, I'm going to be dead. Everything was just hard straight away. Like, I walked 10 minutes up the, this rockery, like, stone hill to start walking up the hill, and already I could feel myself, am I going to be able to do this? To successfully complete our next challenge, we have to reach camp before nightfall, but the constant rain is slowing us down. Luckily, our guide Pepe has something up his sleeve that'll speed us up. A large bag of coca leaves. And the back. We're going to actually put them in our mouths. Is that right, Pepe? I don't know if you've all, any of you have tried coca leaves or you know what they're for. It's basically to it's going to help us alleviate um, the altitude sickness and takes away hunger. Used to make cocaine, chewing the leaves acts as a mild stimulant and should spur us up the mountain. Pepe even blesses the leaves, but it can't disguise their bitter taste, and I'm not sure they're going down well with the team. 
It's kind of musty. Yeah. Um, it's got a real, like, tang to it. All right. Always blessed. Let's carry on. Most of the trek will be at punishingly high altitudes. We've now climbed to three and a half thousand metres, which is over three times as high as Ben Nevis, Britain's tallest mountain, and the team start to feel the effects of the thinner air. I feel like I can't breathe, so I think that's the altitude. Um, I just feel breathlessness. I don't feel tired, I just feel breath like that I can't breathe, but I suppose if I just breathe in slowly, I think I'll be all right. So, Pepe, 3,800 metres here. Yeah. Is that about the height that we're going? No, we're going a little bit higher. <laughs> a little bit higher? Yes, we will <laughs> sleep a little bit higher. And bearing in mind it's 5.30, are you, are you confident we can get there before <laughs> nightfall? Well, we still have another 40 minutes to go. OK, I think we get better get marching. I haven't even got my torch out. No, <laughs> Pepe keeps us going relentlessly. But as well as the altitude, there's one more thing to contend with. I'm just going to show you um, my hand. Look at that one and compare it to that one. <laughs> That's what the insects have done. It's totally and utterly swollen up, and I can't actually close it now. <laughs> the joys of trekking in Peru. As we climb higher and higher, the weaker members of the group start to fall behind. I walk up steps in Whitby, uh, which is pretty, pretty steep, but it, it left all that for the dead. It was unbelievably steep. I'm worried about our progress. It doesn't look like we're going to reach our camp before dark. After trekking for over nine hours, Pepe, our guide, calls a halt. It's getting dark, everyone's exhausted, the temperature's dropping, and we still don't have anywhere to sleep for the night. Uh, we're at camp. Uh, we're at camp. You feel like dropping your rucksack? Do it. Because <laughs> right now, what we're going to do is build our tents. OK. OK? Oh, God. <laughs> my feet were absolutely soaked to the skin. Um, my socks were wet. My boots had let in water. But we were told then that if we want a night's sleep, we have to put the tents up. I once got a blue Peter badge for doing one of these. Pepe throws us three tents, and it was like, oh my God. you know, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this right now. Um, can't believe I'm doing this. This challenge is tougher than it looks. Some of us have never even been near a tent before, let alone put one up at night. Have you not got any poles there? <laughs> and I looked at Francesca, and Francesca looked at me, and it was quite clear neither of us had a clue about what we were going to do. I've lost my sleeping bag. I don't know where it is, so uh, I'm desperate. I've got one at home, but she's not with me. I thought, my God, if this is a star, am I going to ever reach the end? Oh. We're all pretty inept. And without Pepe's help, some of us wouldn't have a tent up before morning. OK. Made a tent. It's my first time I've ever made a tent. It's amazing. And we've got these little um, spongy mattresses. I thought we might have to sleep on the floor, but we don't. <laughs> and with my sleeping bag, I'm going to be very, very cosy. Yeah, come, come see. Uh, In Mark and Francesca's tent, Mark the perfectionist takes control of the domestic arrangements straight away. Point number one, we've got correct. We're leaving our shoes right at the end of the he tent. let me come in. So that we don't get our ground sheet filthy, dirty from back to front. Our final challenge of the day arrives on a plate. We're all starving, but the only meal on offer is a special Peruvian treat. Oh, my God. <laughs> is it rat or guinea pig? Mm. It's guinea pig. Oh, it's got the no, bloody no, hand no. on it. <laughs> <laughs> when my kids were young, we had guinea pigs as pets, and they brought this plate on, and its face was looking at me like this. And the first thought it reminded me of my mother-in-law. Oh, just try, 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 try a little no, bit of this. No. Try anything one. Mia's the first to dare to take a bite. Okay. No, I can't. What do you think? Sorry. Chicken. 
What do you think, Shelley? Right. Chicken, isn't it? <laughs> I just thought it was really nice. I wondered why there was all, like, um, guinea pigs running around a lot. There was loads of them running around everywhere. But I just thought they had loads of pets. <laughs> or they were strays or something. It's like, a, it's like a slightly salty chicken. But it was all too much for one member of the team. Yeah, I just had to leave. I can't even eat my tofu. <laughs> it's gross. They've got little hairs and you see the little teeth in there. I'm so glad I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> After today's incredibly tough trek, everyone needs some light relief. And resident camp entertainer Howard's on hand to get things going. She'll be coming round the mountains. Coming round the mountains. She'll be coming round the mountains when she goes. Singing high, high, Everyone did fantastically well today. I think we really pushed everyone um, to just about their limits. We're at about 3,800 meters here, which is pretty high, but we have about another 1,000 meters to go. Um, but all in all, I've been really impressed with how everyone's done. Um, just wish everything would dry. It's day two of this week's Extreme Dreams. We're trekking through the High Andes, a remote and perilous mountain range in Peru, South America. Our goal, to reach the amazing lost city of the Incas, Choquiquerao. We'll be crossing through high mountain passes and into low tropical jungle, and it isn't going to be easy for any of us. The route we're taking to get to the lost city is so hazardous that less than 100 people have attempted it in the last century. The five members of my team each have a powerful reason for attempting this journey. Single mum Shelley wants to find the confidence to change her life. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. I think it's going to show me how strong I am and how far I can push myself. Here we go. Events Here we go. manager and self-confessed control freak Mark feels it's time he learnt to let go. What I want from this trip is to prove to myself that I can do these things. Call centre worker Francesca has had difficulty being a team player. I know what I like and know what I don't like. And that's the way I have it. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> Feisty full-time mum of three, Mia, wants to prove she's capable of anything. You are who you are through experience, and um, this is just going to add in a totally positive way and, you know, make me a much better person. And the oldest member of the team, Howard Levy, wants to show he can keep up with the youngsters. I'd hate to let anybody down. I'd hate me to be the one lagging at the back and saying, I can't go any further. Five very different people, but they all have one thing in common. They want to transform their lives. Previously on Extreme Dreams, just hours after touching down in Peru, my team faced their first test. We were confronted by the raging waters of the river Urubamba, and there was only one way to get across. Single mum Shelley suffers from vertigo and was terrified. Don't like none of that. Next, we hiked miles into the wilderness. We got our first taste of the hardships to come. It was all up here and I thought, I'm going to die on this trip, I think. I don't think I'm going to last a few days. And the insects got their first taste of us. Look at that one. You can compare it to that one. As darkness fell, we staggered into camp. It was a reality check that made me realise that this ain't going to be a piece of cake. Where our final ordeal arrived on a plate. Oh, my <laughs> God. Is it rat or guinea pig? Mm. It's guinea pig. Oh, it's got the... <laughs> Dawn in the Andes. We've had our first night in tents beneath the Vilcabamba Mountains. The surroundings might be impressive, but no one slept well. Supermum Mia had a restless night. Last night was pretty bad, yeah. I didn't get any sleep at all. Um, the longest night. 
I got lost in my sleeping bag about 20 times. Couldn't find my hot water bottle about 20 times. Um, couldn't sleep, I think I've got insomnia. The oldest member of the team, Howard, has had even bigger problems. I've got a queasy stomach, whether it's because I've got a stomach bug or whether it's the altitude affecting me, I really don't know. But hopefully today, with this beautiful weather that looks like it's, it's imminently here, uh, we should have a fantastic day, but please, not as hard as yesterday. That was gruelling. Unfortunately for Howard, this trek is not going to get any easier. Today, we have to cross a pass nearly 5,000 metres high. That's four times the height of Ben Nevis. Coming up on the second leg of our journey to find the lost city of the Incas. Howard's 55-year-old legs just can't take the pace on the highest climb of the trek. And every time we turn a corner, there's another massive hill to climb. The whole team struggles as we're literally starved of oxygen. I keep coming over a bit dizzy, so I have to sit down. And emotions run high as we crest the peak. If my dad, God rest his soul, was alive today, he'd be very proud. <laughs> Our first challenge today is to walk 16 miles and climb to 5,000 metres to reach the Chokitakapo mountain pass. The steep gradient and slippery paths are going to make this walk treacherous enough, but there's another hazard we're going to have to confront. Oh, the body can feel this already. We have another 1,000 metres to go. Up here, there's far less oxygen in the atmosphere, which is going to put us all at risk of suffering altitude sickness. In the mountains of the Andes, it's one of the biggest killers. So I've asked our Peruvian guide, Pepe, to spell out the dangers to the group. There's something I have to tell you, warn you, which is very important to your health. Normally, everybody here gets a little bit of a headache, perhaps dizzy and nauseated. That is quite normal. But remember, in order to stay healthy, you have to drink lots of fluids. Then if you get dizzy and you feel really sick, I have to know it. All right? Right, guys, well, I have to say that as I have experienced altitude sickness in the past, it's not very nice. And, um, and I think there is this tendency to make it invisible and not let anyone else know about it because you just want to forge on. So can I make a suggestion that as a group, we kind of do a buddy system? The buddy system means that we all have someone to look out for us. And I'll be keeping an extra close eye on our oldest team member, Howard. Have a little stop just up here. I'm worried that the altitude and the punishingly steep climb is hitting him the hardest. Howard's really suffering. I think he's got a bit of a, a dodgy belly, which doesn't, doesn't help because it kind of saps your energy and it, it just makes you feel lethargic and it just makes everything that much harder. Two hours later and we've only climbed 300 metres. We're only a third of the way and the extreme conditions are now taking their toll on the whole team. A bit breathless. Uh, lungs don't seem to have the capacity that they do. Uh, lower down. We're all struggling with breathing quite a lot. Our lungs seem to have crumpled a little bit because someone's like really pushing in the chest. Howard's now really struggling to keep up with the others. Are you just feeling a bit breathless? Yeah. Just take it easy. Just a bit disorientated. No breath at all. My heart's banging. As I got higher and higher, it not only became more difficult for me physically, on my feet, and my knees and my legs. But you get this horrible feeling of, of a sickness that I haven't had since I was a kid. And you do start shortage of breath. It's almost, God forbid, like having a heart attack. Well, guys, I just had a look at my watch. And according to this, we are now at the big 4000 4,000 meters. That is very good going, guys. Well, that was a steep old climb. And it's difficult because it's not just a breathlessness, but you have a bit of a, you know, a slight dull thud in the head. And um, it's all a bit, if you look at the clouds, it's, it feels a little bit um, hallucinogenic, if that's the word. Just as things are looking up, disaster strikes. Blinding rain and freezing fog turn this hike into a test of endurance. It's just... The rain, the cold, the wind. And every time we turn a corner, there's another massive hill to climb.
very cold, very damp, very wet. We still have about 200 meters to go. I think it's really, you can see how slowly they're kind of shuffling along. Just doing it really, really slowly now, taking the pace, stopping quite a lot. Um, just like, even just stopping just to stand still for a second. I want to see your eyes. To make matters worse, Close Pepe pose. spots the first signs right. of altitude yeah, sickness amongst pose. some of the team. Mm. Open them up. Yeah, they're quite fine. What are you looking for then? Signs of pupil dilation or...? Exactly. Because when you have high altitude sickness, you react a lot slower. You feel a little bit dizzy there. Yeah. Close your eyes tight. Okay. All right, open them up. Yeah, they are slower. Oh, are they? Yours are. There's some good news. So, Howard seems OK. So but Francesca's health is more of a worry. The symptoms I've got were like... Like when you're really hungover and then you stand up too fast and everything for two seconds, you're like, oh, my head was all spinning and I couldn't see and I'm just, nothing, everything was all a bit, like, you were, like I was underwater, everything, everything felt different. It was really weird. It's now Francesca who's our biggest cause for concern. I'm worried about Francesca. I think she's, uh, she's determined, but I think possibly a bit stubborn. I know how hard I'm finding it without having slightest dizzy smell yet. Um, she's saying to me she can't see the road in front of her. I mean, that's, to my mind, that's just nuts. More than nuts. I'm all right, I just, I keep coming over a bit dizzy, so I have to sit down. I know he says that it's the wrong thing to do. I can barely breathe. I can't talk anymore. Francesca's symptoms are getting worrying. We can help her, but she needs to listen to the advice she's been given. Do you know what hyperventilating is? Have you heard of it? This place where you go. That's what I was doing down there, like. Well, that's quite dangerous. You, you don't want to. Well, that's floor. why you were getting dizzy. I couldn't see the floor, and it was all going all like weird. And I just thought well, I was going to pass you're, out. Well, that's because you've got a lack of oxygen. Basically, there's a lot, a lot less oxygen up here. A lot less. So for every breath you take up here, you actually probably need two compared to what you would take down at sea level. Despite my best efforts to keep her going, Francesca's getting slower and slower. Endless stopping in this freezing rain not only makes the dizziness worse, but could also make your core body temperature plunge dangerously low. Pepe, our guide, knows that at these altitudes and temperatures, you can lose the ability for rational thought if you don't keep going. Francesca. It will be worse every time you sit. Take my word. Stop. Believe me, just stop standing. But if you sit, it will be worse. You can get really sick. Well, I do care. I'm responsible. I do care. Let's go. Let's say warm. Let's say warm, slowly but steady. Vamos. I think it was really only after Pepe had spent several minutes telling her of the risks that if she stayed sat for very much longer hypothermia would start to set in she needed to keep moving you know all her outer extremities her fingers and toes would start to get numb very very quickly Pepe's expert advice finally seems to get through to Francesca and keeping a close eye on her we struggle up the last few meters Thousand six hundred meters. This is the highest pass we're going to be crossing on our way oh. to to the Inca ruins. Fantastic. What do you make of that? When I got to the top of that mountain and we saw the view, and we were soaking wet, and I felt sick, and I couldn't breathe, and it was I was cold, and I was exhausted. Every little bit of me hurt. But as soon as you got to the top, none of that mattered at all. You just saw the view, and you saw what you'd done. It was just like it was amazing. It was really good. I think we all cried, didn't we? <laughs> This is just stunning. I mean, it has made everything worthwhile. There's no feeling like walking over that little cliff just there. Just incredible. 
who cares about the rain now. <laughs> After struggling all the way, Howard standing proud. <laughs> Unbelievable. Me, an humble market trader from Leeds, to be stood here looking at this, uh, it just, I, it's beyond belief. If my dad, God rest his soul, was alive today, he'd be very proud. He would. Very proud of me. They've um, got that thing that trips and adventures are all about when you finally reach that point that you're you're focusing on. And um, you know, none of them have ever done this before, but they've already got it straight away. They've worked out that if you break it down, you know, we've still got a long way to go to Jockey Kikero, but um, but they've worked out if you break it into little blocks, it's brilliant. <laughs> Still to come on the second leg of our trek to the lost city of the Incas. Climbing up was tough enough, but getting down the other side pushes single mum Shelley over the edge. Oh my God, it's your back with the edge. Don't worry, I promise you I'm fine. And one of the team decides she's had enough and strikes out alone. At last, we're on the way down, but this mountain hasn't finished with us yet. It's already pushed Howard and Francesca to their limits. Now it's Shelley's turn. She's terrified of heights, and the thousand foot drop just inches to her side has paralyzed her with fear. Yeah, just got the path over I don't there. like the bridges. You'll be fine, just don't look. And when I got round the corner, I realized there was like no, there was no side, this mountain. Like it was just literally a mountain, and you, could, there you couldn't see the bottom. Don't worry about me. You just clutch to the side. Okay. I was scared and all because Ben was trying to concentrate on me, but I kept thinking he's not really concentrating on the stairs himself, so that was making me scared. And I thought, what is everyone doing to me? Oh, oh my these, God. These steps. Don't worry, honestly. Oh. That went to the extreme. That's when it hit me, and I thought, there can't be anything worse than this. Oh, my God, there's your back with the edge. Don't worry, I promise you I'm fine. Look, I'm Even with there. my hand in a vice-like grip, progress is painfully slow. You're doing brilliantly. I thought, oh my God, if I die on this trip, then what the hell is my daughter going to do without me? The path we were on was fantastic, but obviously the drop she wasn't happy with. But um, she's equally scared of someone <laughs> going near the edge, so she was actually more paranoid about me being near the edge than her going <laughs> over the edge, so it was like a, a double whammy for her. She's hysterical with fear right now. Facing up to your greatest fears is what Extreme Dreams is all about. But unfortunately for Shelley, we're not off this mountain yet. We've still got 10 long miles to go before we reach our next camp. Oh, it's me! Anybody else on right? Oh. So let's take off your cape and I'm going to help you down again. Yeah, like before. We'll be fine. Yeah, as a team, all of us. What was me? Oh. Yeah. I'm scared of high. It's happened to hold me because I'm so frightened. We're all scared. We all have different things I'm as well. Scared, being scared, that's all. Shelley's so scared she can barely move. It's clear that she can't take much more. We decide that the only way we're going to get Shelley down in one piece is to lash her to Pepe the guide and literally drag her down. With the light disappearing rapidly, it's clear that we all need to get off this mountain and fast. Hold on my pack. Hold on my pack. Hold on my pack. Just on my pack. On my pack, that's it. Very good. I just thought, oh, slow down, slow down. And it was, it was all in, in his control. And I felt like I'm just giving all my weight in that, on this man. And can he, can he support me and hung onto the, the mountainside? Are you OK? Yeah. Good. With Pepe guiding Shelley's every step, I'm now making sure Francesca keeps up with the group. Just look for the rocks. The lower we go, the better her altitude sickness gets but there's still the treacherous ground to contend with. Remember what I said about the stick? Yeah, I got oh. There was inches to spare, and if you'd have slipped, that'd have been it. There was no, just no second chance. There was nothing to hold on to, nothing to grab. You were just straight down to the bottom. How beautiful is that? It looks like an oil painting. The stunning view can't hide the fact that it's nearly dark and we're still four miles from camp. Right, guys, do you think 
we should get our hip torches out at this stage, just in case. I think it's probably worth it, because something tells me we're going to be <laughs> out after dark. Yep. The day's delays are just too much for feisty mum of three, Mia. Breaking the first rule of mountaineering, she leaves the rest of us and strikes out on her own. Uh, I just felt that I had to break away from the group and um, look after number one, really. Our Peruvian wranglers have gone ahead to make camp. With only her torch to guide her, she sets off down the tiny path to catch up with them. It wasn't, you know, a set out path or a smooth pavement or anything. These were rocks that had just sort of fallen from above, you know. I was, you know, really proud of myself because, um, you know, I could only see this little sort of pool of light in front of me. Mia's decision to tear up the trekking rule book doesn't go down well with the rest of the team. We wondered where Mia was because having sort of that day kind of talked about the buddy system and things like that, you end up seeing that somebody is operating very much on their own and really the group of five of you is really only a group of four. Francesca and Mia were buddies and I don't think she even stopped once to um, see if Francesca was okay. An hour after Mia, the rest of us arrive at camp. That was a killer, absolute killer. Bad enough in the daylight, but in the blooming I dark. It's just, uh, I even gave up standing in donkey turds. I just went for it. <laughs> I One of now. the worst days in Shelley's life is finally over. You know, everyone just has complete admiration. I think we all told you, just really try and go for it. And you did, and you made it, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you felt scared or worried or anything. I mean, the point is that you did it, and that's just fantastic. Whilst most of the team enjoy a well-earned drink, Shelley's retired to her tent. Her family and friends have written letters to her to open when she's at her lowest ebb. Hi, Shelley, if you're reading this, I imagine that things are getting a little tough. So all I can say is remember that this is the most challenging thing you've ever done. Challenging things are the most rewarding. And if you can get through this, which I know you can, if you can get through anything, you are one of the most strongest and courageous, beautiful and bravest women I know. Never forget that. I love you, Alicia. He's not like my best friend. I'm so sorry, I'm crying. I, won't, I wouldn't quit because I'm not a quitter, but I just didn't want to let the group down. And um, so I was worried about that. But reading these letters from my friends and my family, to make me feel like they're so proud of me back there for doing this. <sighs> I can't believe that they did it. It's been a day of exhaustion and elation. We've crossed a mammoth hurdle in our path, the highest peak we'll have to face on our journey to the lost city. But the first real cracks in the group have started to show. I'm not sure things are going to be any easier tomorrow. I think, unfortunately, with the group bonding, um, we're experiencing um, a, a runaway, if you like. Um, I, I don't know that, really, at this point, Mia knows much about her fellow colleagues, and quite frankly, I don't think she cares. Salud. Everyone, cheers. cheers. Salud. 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 It's 6 a.m. on day four of our trek to Choquiquerao. It's the start of another gruelling day for us all. Well, yesterday really tested the team when we crossed a pass nearly 5,000 metres high. Everyone's still exhausted, and today the trek is even longer and the air is still thin. We're facing a huge seven-mile hike over difficult ground to our next camp at the remote village of Yanomar. It's meant to take eight hours, but in these conditions, it could be twice as long. If we make it, we'll be halfway towards our goal, the lost city of the Incas. We've been warned that this pass is going to be very boggy, wet and slippery, and it's certainly living up to that. Howard is the oldest member of the team and clearly feeling the strain. Now today's uh, another day, another chapter in the book of life. Uh, another adventure around the corner waiting to happen. I'm not a very religious man, but I prayed to God last night that it wasn't going to be as hard today. 
The trail goes along. But things are already not looking good. Pepe, our guide, is worried that yesterday's torrential rain may have washed away part of today's route. He's going ahead to check, leaving us alone to follow the river to our meeting point. On our own, guys. We're all going to get bloody lost. <laughs> we'll manage. We'll do it. Down the valley, follow the river, and then up on the left a little. After last night's terrifying walk in the dark, we're all desperate to get to camp before nightfall. But we haven't even been walking for half an hour before we're stopped in our tracks. Mia! 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 Mia has gone missing. Do we think we need to move down a little bit, just in case she's gone? Yeah, because where she went. Where we were, because if she comes back... Does anybody know where she went? That way. We're in the middle of nowhere, in one of the most hostile environments on Earth. Straying off the path in these mountains can literally mean death. It's just not safe to wander about alone. It was a strange area to all of us. We didn't know whether to wait, to look. Very, very worrying. Nobody knew where she was, whether she'd gone forward, whether she'd tripped her to self, or all of a sudden she's taken ill. All sorts of scenarios came up. Yeah, but she might have just gone in up that bit. She might come back in that bit. How far could she have gone? I think an hour or something went past, and I started thinking, do you know what? We're in the middle of a, um, we're in the middle of Peru, in a completely country we don't know. She's never been in this mat, like this forest before in her life. She has really gone, and I thought, and that's when the, the panic started setting in. Well, let's make a team decision. What do you want? We can either all head off we as a group. We could split up into. Yeah, I don't think we should split up really. I think I we should stay as a, split as a group. But we could either just wait here for a bit longer, hoping she'll come back because this is where we were. Yeah. Or we all head off in the direction, no, last here. person. 10 more minutes. I think it's always best to just wait where we are. Mia! We've waited for over an hour, but there's still no sign of Mia. Is she lost, injured, or worse? Well, you know, we're in the middle of deepest, darkest Peru. And none of us really know our way. We, we, obviously, we've got the river, and, um, and Pepe left us because he felt confident that we could, um, we could find our, our way. But um, we made a group decision. We'd remain in the position where, we, where she disappeared from us as such. So, um, yeah, it's probably not great for her out there. But, you know, last night she disappeared off, didn't she? And she found her way back to camp on her own. So um, I think part of us is hoping that her, her homing pigeon instinct will, um, will kick in again. One, two, three. Mia! The rest of us are at a loss to know what to do. And whatever we decide now could be crucial for all of us. If Mia's injured, we're losing valuable time. And if she isn't, we're wasting precious daylight standing around waiting. It's quarter to 11. I think we said we'd wait for about 10, five, 10 minutes. We've waited here for ages. We've been in for an hour. Just, just so that we're, we've definitely thought about it. If we get back to camp and she's not there, Oh. Really? Yeah. I don't even want to think about that. Really then we've got a problem. Yeah, then we've got a problem. Mia! Mia! With heavy hearts, we make the difficult decision to move on. I want to see me do stuff I've never done before. I want to see how far I can take myself without me breaking down and screaming, oh, my God, what have I done? I know what I like and know what I don't like, and that's the way I have it. I'm a perfectionist. There you go, I said it, yeah. I'm not Superwoman, but I do a good impression. <laughs> I feel that before I get too old, I'd like to see places and see the world and see how the people live.
don't like none of that. I'm so scared. I wouldn't quit because I'm not a quitter. There we go. I don't worry about you, don't worry about me. And how the hell would we have found you, to be quite honest? I'll sit there laughing. I can barely breathe. <gasps> Please stop filming me, I will smash that eight face. We'll manage, we'll do it. This is a killer. Oh. I wondered upwards. Oh. It was worth it just for that. excited about anything after I have some chocolate. Leave me alone. <laughs> I suppose a little bit anxious about how far we've got to go to get today just because we didn't quite do as much as we were supposed to yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> God help us. Lousy, I've had the runs all night. I've been to the loo about five times. Socks are soaked, every pair's covered in mud. My boots are caked in mud. So, not happy bunny at the moment. I'm just trying to come round. So, my stomach's just, everything I eat, it's just going through like water. They all seem a lot more nervous today. It's really interesting. It's the first time I've, they've been this quiet, but I think um, four days of trekking is really starting to take its toll. If anyone lost their grip in there, it's not just a soaking you're going to get. That's what be the hardest thing ever. Moment you'd want to last forever. This is an emergency situation now. It's, the longer we leave it, the, the worse it becomes. Sounds good. Oh. Well, finally, the Rio Blanco is in sight, but we've got about another hour of descent and it's getting really hot. You can see the sweat and the bugs are getting really nasty. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it because I can't quite see how rough it is, but it looks pretty rough. The water is really strong. Be careful. This is a fast-flowing river. You literally put your stick into it, and, and it was shot out of your hand. When you then put your first foot in, you were very aware of the fact that there was this powerful water, and not really much of a slip would have sent you downstream. It is strong! Can you get your grip? Careful. D -d -d hold me, hold me now. Hold me okay, now. That's what's, uh, Pepe. 
That's good. That was really frightening because there was no room or element for a mistake. You'd have just been swept away. I was a bit worried because um, if anyone lost their gripping there, it's not just a soaking you're going to get. Um, we'd probably end up in Chile. <laughs> not really where we're planning on going to. But it's not over yet because we're now in a little island in the middle of the river and we've got to cross on a, on a kind of plank of wood, which I think they're going to find harder, to tell you the truth. They weren't really bridges, they were just kind of a couple of wooden planks that just randomly happened to be there. And they were probably going to break at any time and really looked like we were going to break. Really slow, you know. Good. Couldn't have been that long before you'd hit your head. And you, you, there's no stopping the river. I mean, you would have just been bobbing all the way down to wherever it came out, I would think. Very good. Man, very good. Very, very good. just exhilarating, uh, cold, um, but after that long walk, you know, it was just what the doctor ordered. I just wished I could have stayed in it forever, really. I feel alive! Two, three! Oh, 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 Two or three hours we've been walking, feet were killing me, aches, pains, and you go in there and suddenly it, all the worries have gone again. It's, it's unbelievable, it's like that all the time. I realised at that point that my health was suffering badly and I wasn't getting any better. The energy and the strength was going by the hour and that was worrying me, A, what I had, and B, how I'm going to get off a mountain that was hundreds of miles from civilization. How, how am I going to do it? Look at that, Howard. Oh, that is the sight of the most beautiful Hola, senor. Woman in the world. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> well, we didn't reach that donkey a minute too soon. It was quite hairy walking up there with Howard because his balance seems to be going a little bit as well. And there were a few times when he was kind of swaying like that, and I was kind of pushing my hand out to stop him literally going over the side. But I think myself and Pepe were going to make sure he gets up this mountain, whether he likes it or not, we'll carry him between us. We're gonna make, he's not coming this far to not continue. It was quite zigzaggy, and every time you got to a corner, I looked up hoping this would be the end of it. It just seemed endless. The plants and the, the flora and fauna and everything were beautiful, but uh, it was, really tough. Just look at that view, Francesca. Isn't that amazing? I thought, well, if I, if I cry and just stop, I'm not going to get back up again. So I just kind of held it back and just thought, I'll just carry on and do it. It was really, really hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. 
hundred times harder in the heat. <laughs> oh. Peppy's got a good body for a man for a man of his age, um, and it's um, scarred. You know, I didn't ask him about the scars, but it looks like he's been fighting with a lion or something. <laughs> Puma, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, Mia fancied the pants off Pepe. I mean, you know, you can't blame her, really. Um, he, was, he was a great guy. He was a really good guy. This is so much. <laughs> Because we're stuck here, the helicopter can't come in. That was really hard. I'm so happy I'm here. I'm going to get some water. It has been so baking hot today, it's not even true. Face feels like it's been burnt. I'm absolutely shattered. And now I'm going to get soaking wet. <laughs> Great. I'm now feeling exceptionally weak and very tired. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as soon as the tent's set, I'm just going to crash out and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. But I just feel absolutely terrible. Hi, it's me. Well, you're breaking up a little bit, so I'll have to go, but I'll see you in a little while. Hello, Mum. Can you hear me? How's Paris? Oh, she's sleeping. Has she been good? God. Has she missed me? Has she said anything about me? Oh, <laughs> I love you. I don't know, I want to cry now, guys. <laughs> For goodness sake, you're doing this to me. Oh, my God, my daughter keeps asking when I'm coming home. When I heard my mum's voice on the other end, I was, like, so emotional. My mum was like, Shelley, and I was like, Mum. And um, I was so excited. I wanted to tell her so much, but I couldn't get it all out. Yeah, that, that phone call was the best. It was, it was brilliant to hear my mum's voice. And she was so happy. She was like, where am I? It was like, I saw a man inside. Halfway across the world. These are tears of joy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dad. I have no doubt that you're doing very well. I... I'm sorry I can't do it. I do miss them all. I just wanted to write a little note to say hi. And if you're ever feeling homesick or tired, then I just wanted to know that all your family and friends are right behind you and won't stop thinking of you. We're all so proud of you for going ahead with this unique trip. If anyone could be a part of this wonderful experience, then you can break a leg. Little does he know. Lots of love, Ollie. He was my eldest boy. It was a very lovely, well-written, caring, thoughtful letter. Perfectly timed on that night, because I was all for throwing myself over the mountain and just putting myself out of the misery. But it lifted me. But I just kept thinking of the words that he said in the letter, and uh, I've still got the letter at home. It's, it was a magical moment for me, a magical moment. A long day tomorrow. What time's the call? You guys, 5.30. You know, you can't choose who you have chemistry with. It just seems to be with me, and um, chemistry's there with um, maybe people that I can't 
have a future with, you know. I can't live happily ever after with Pepe, you know. <laughs> More than 7,000 miles in between us. I might become his third girlfriend um, just for a couple of days. I'll let you know. It's not like I've got anyone special at home, you know. Oh, what a day. The team went from dealing with that high altitude and its lack of oxygen to the hot, steamy tropical jungles down in the valley. And tomorrow it's the big push to Chocchi Carao, which will include a sheer 500 metre ascent. Very worried. Yeah, do you want to? And it is so that we're stuck here. We're stuck here. I'm very concerned about Howard. I mean, uh, he's losing too much fluids, and I'm worried about get him getting dysentery, and he can't retain anything, anything. He can get into a shock, and then we will have to carry him. Yeah. I mean, it could kill someone here. It could kill someone. It, it happened last year. Pepe was saying that it had obviously got really onto his system and his immune system wasn't effectively coping with it. And we're being told that, you know, he's woken up um, and he's barely awake. He's just kind of very lethargic, pale, um, and just really, really, really ill. We have to get him out of here and there's no way that we can do that right now. Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous to walk over that pass right now. Presumably a helicopter can't come in this weather. No, absolutely not. Howard, hi. Just lay there. Lay there. Stay, lay stay there. there, Howard. Don't move. There's no way I could have moved my head off that pillow. It was almost like I, I didn't have a. Um, I wasn't shaking or shivering or anything like malaria or anything. Just every bit of energy had gone, and I just felt so ill and put just proper poorly, as they say. It was horrible feeling. I'm sorry to stop me for a six. Is this? Just uh, too disgusting to talk on camera. Don't worry, Howard. If I had been told, right, when we were leaving, I would have had to say, well, leave me here to die. And I knew there was something seriously wrong with me. I've never ever experienced a, a feeling of bad health like that in my life. It's four years high. Mm. It's very pale. We all knew how it was ill, but I don't think any of us realised quite how bad it had got. And that morning when he didn't come down, when we saw him, um, I did think he was going to die. I think we all did. We were really, really scared. So, Howard, we're totally on top of things, OK? So the, don't worry yourself. Pepe's going to administer you with anything that we can in the meantime. And we're going to sort out for a helicopter to come, OK? When I saw Pepe's face looking at me, I could tell he was very concerned. And he's a worldly man, a great survivor. And I could see the look on his face. That made me feel even more worried. If he was worried about me, I really am ill. Just, just, should I tell you what we're doing anyway, just so you know? I'll fill you in. That basically, the weather's too treacherous for us to go on full stop. That's us, all of us, OK? Yeah. So nothing to do with you. We're staying put, and it's nothing to do with you. How are you feeling now? It's so weak. Yeah. Just stay down. Don't My bring stomach's your stomach's just—it's not hurting, but I just can't—I can't control the motion. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just shattered because I haven't slept. Of course. He's right on the limit. He's not—he doesn't have a fever, but he's hot. That is one thing. The other thing is that the smell—it it, it smells like really sick from a sick person. So, uh, on top, he looks very weak. I mean, he's not a man that can even walk on his own feet to the toilet. We can't take a risk. Adulto de todos, que se llama Howard, que está muy mal. Si es que se puede traer un helicóptero. 
the helicopter's not around. He, he says that um, the Cusco helicopter, which should be the nearest one, is, is on another rescue mission. And this is, you know, this is an emergency situation now. It's getting kind of, the longer we leave it, the, the worse it becomes. And um, I'm really anxious to get him out. And I'm also anxious not to get the rest of the team too worried. And I think there is a, you know, they're really concerned about Howard and themselves. And it's important that everyone stays calm. But obviously the, the longer this goes on and the longer the helicopter takes to arrive, the worse everyone's going to feel. Ben and Pepe obviously know what they're doing. I think they, um, the worst part is that Howard is, is worse. Because we're stuck here. The helicopter can't come in. And that's the only worry I have. We've been speaking to the emergency services and, um, and it looks like the helicopter can't come till tomorrow, um, which isn't great. in the tent and we heard a helicopter. Now, it's not due to be here till tomorrow, but it's too much of a coincidence that a helicopter would be passing around here. But it's disappeared over the brow of the hill. I think I can hear it. Here it comes again, here it comes again, here it comes. So we've got to get, we need something, um, here it is, here it is. It is ours, yeah? It's got to be ours. Okay. Muevanse, muevanse, rápido. So we've grabbed as many red things as we can so that we can try and um, show them a, a landing spot because we can't afford to miss this. Obviously, we are like a needle in a haystack trying to find us here. Um, problem is the helicopter's disappeared for the third time. And if it's, if it's missed us, because we, we it, it's, a, it's a fair old hike to get up here. Oh, I'm still out of breath. If it's missed us, that's it. It's going to run out of fuel. I'll have to go back to Cusco. I have to try again. What we think is it's probably gone to Choque Carao, because um, that's where we were heading. We just got to hope it comes back now. It's not great. Poor Howard, because he'll have, you know, the others down in camp will have probably been dragging him from his tent and getting him all ready. And imagine what it must be like someone saying, Yay, the helicopter's coming. You can get, get out and get well. And now we've got to go back with the bad news. It's not until tomorrow. You just heard this helicopter go off into the distance. That feeling of kind of utter uselessness and just really, really deflated. His face was drained and he just, he looked about 10 years older and he just like, looked like this little dying man. It was like, Howard, are you in there somewhere? It was horrible. So, it's all about tomorrow. The skies are beginning to clear and we're praying, even chanting, that the rains don't come again tomorrow so that not only can the helicopter arrive to evacuate Howard, but that we can get off on the long, long trek to Choque Carao. It's the final day of our week-long trek across the high Andes, the wild and desolate mountain range that forms the backbone of Peru in South America. Our goal is to reach the amazing lost city of the Incas, Choquiquerao. Already we've battled across 200 miles of the world's most treacherous terrain, 
taking a route so dangerous, only a hundred people have used it in the last century. We've trekked at high altitude, ridden horses along narrow mountain passes, crossed raging rivers and survived out in the wilderness. Every member of my team has pushed themselves further than ever before. All we've got is these, these steps. Don't worry, honestly. Londoner Shelley has wrestled with her fear of heights all week long. Oh my God, it's not about the eggs. Don't worry, I promise you I'm fine. I'm so scared and every day just gets getting worse and worse for me. And she's missed her daughter Paris terribly. I love you. Oh my God, my daughter keeps asking when I'm coming home. But she's dug deep and kept going. Call centre worker Francesca from Brighton has also refused to give in, even as we inched along a 4,000 metre high precipitous mountain pass. If you sit, it will be worse. You can't get really sick. I'm all right. I just, I keep coming over a bit dizzy. And she's saying to me she can't see the road in front of her. Civil servant Mark has been the backbone of the team, supporting the others in their times of need. We'll manage. We'll do it. But his patience was tested to the limits when team member Mia went walkabout. How the hell would we have found you, to be quite honest? I'll sit there laughing. Mia may have mastered the mountain, but she struggled to bond with the rest of the group. Oh, so I don't think we gel. I think we... It's the opposite of gel. Grind. Howard's health and fitness have dogged him throughout the trip. This is a killer. First, the market trader from Leeds suffered swollen knees, then an upset stomach, and finally he was struck down with a mystery fever. This is an emergency situation now. It's getting kind of, the longer we leave it, the, the worse it becomes. We were forced to call for an evacuation. But bad weather on the mountain meant the rescue helicopter couldn't find us. It's missed us, that's it. It's going to run out of fuel. I have to go back to Kuzke. We just got to... I hope it comes back now. It's dawn on the final morning of our journey to find the lost city of the Incas. Thankfully, Howard's feeling a little better this morning, but he's still too weak to go any further. I've got a good family, two good, good lads, good wife, uh, so I don't have to prove anything to them. This was purely, selfishly, for me to prove. And I've nearly succeeded. So I've done the best I can. We've made the painful decision to carry on, leaving Howard with some of our Peruvian guides to wait for the helicopter to return. Now it's time to say our goodbyes. Hi, Howard. Good morning, Ben. How are you? You're looking a little brighter a bit today. brighter today, yes. Yeah, I am signed my death warrant yet. Oh. Well, but you know, uh, we've sadly got to go. I know. Because we've, we've got to try and reach it by nightfall, so it's right. not the way we wanted to say goodbye, but hopefully we'll see you again in Cusco. Oh, I hope so. Hope so. As long as you make it and the helicopter doesn't, then I'm banging <laughs> <the train. laughs> Well, we're, we're leaving you with some capable porters and things. I know. I know. Do, dig it up, dig oh, it up. Are you I'm sure? Do, yeah. Are you sure? It's nice to stand up for a bit. Okay. Well, listen, good Take luck. Take care. Have a great good luck. Last day. Yeah. Suddenly, the people that I cared for in that trip were going. And I said bye-bye to them and uh, I missed them. Very, very emotional, that. Yeah, it was hard. Bye, Howard. It was really sad, because I so wanted him to finish the trip, I really did. Um, Howard's great and, you know, he'd, he'd tried so hard and he'd found it so hard and He'd got so far, being so ill. I was really upset that he was leaving it. It broke the team and it was like, I wanted everybody to finish together because we'd got really close. Take care. Bye, Howard, darling. Enjoy it. Yeah, Take it all in. I will. I felt sorry for him because I got on with Howard. I thought it was funny. And um, it's like we lost a part of our group. So, yeah, it was um, very sad and emotional. Adios, amigos. Chao, compadre. <laughs> All right, go carefully. Watch how you go. All the best. Uh, my thoughts are with them, and uh, I'll be with them in spirit. And uh, I'll see them at the end of the trail. My team 
the ones that we gelled with. My little family were all going ahead. And that's what I didn't want to happen. I wanted to be there at the end. I wanted to complete this whole trip and I'd suffered for so long, but now I knew that I couldn't do it. And it was, it was a great, very, very upset that I couldn't do it. I let myself down. But you can't fight pain and you can't fight bad health. As the rest of the team head off, Howard's left alone with his thoughts. My dad was 47 when he died. My mother was 51. It's just no age. <laughs> Had to do this for them. I don't know why. I've never cried in my life, and this week all I've done is cry. It's like, it's, it's unbelievable. We're climbing the final mountain that lies between us and our goal, the lost city of the Incas, Choquiquerao. It's a gruelling 3,000 foot climb over eight kilometers. We're all praying that the clouds clear for Howard's helicopter and for us. Our guide Pepe is worried about the visibility and the distance we must cover before dark. He sets a relentless pace. We're a bit behind schedule, so uh, the pace is actually quite quick. <laughs> so Pepe and uh, Mia have gone that way, and uh, I'm somewhere in the middle, and then um, the others are somewhere that way. So um, I was just taking a breather to uh, catch my breath, I think. Um, it's, it is hard going. What Mark doesn't realise is that a major crisis has developed behind him, which threatens to completely derail the final push to find the lost city of the Incas. Oh, we have a big problem with Francesca. She hasn't eaten for days, and um, I'm not quite sure what's up, but she's... I've always made sure I've been at the back of the group. It's always important to have Pepe at the front, me at the back to keep, you know, keep everyone in sight and she's basically refusing to let me walk behind. She's demanded that she walks on her own so I walked ahead a bit and she's, she's not moving. Francesca suffers from a hyperactivity disorder which she's normally able to keep in check but the stress of the last few days have sent her into a spiral of anxiety. I can't concentrate enough to walk continuously because I keep having to start and look around and stuff. And now I find it a bit difficult to relate to anybody. The word kind of that spread through the group that she was going, and we just couldn't believe it, you know, because she had struggled and suffered, but she'd done so amazingly well to get to this point. It's the worst case scenario for the group. If Francesca refuses to go on, we all have to return to camp, and none of us will reach Jockey Cadal. Francesca was having a just a bad, I suppose a bad day that day. And halfway up this mountain side, she stopped, but she completely stopped. And she was, she sat down and she said she wasn't going to move. I understand what she's going through because it was hard. But I was thinking, there's no other way for us to finish this trip unless you get up and you do it with us. And it was like, at that point, it was like no reasoning with her. I just thought, pick yourself up. Like, come on. For Francesca, Extreme Dreams has been about confronting her temper and being happy in a team. But it hasn't been easy for her, and now, at the most crucial moment, she's threatening to walk back. At that point, um, it was very close that she was going to um, walk back down the hill. Um, and that was what she wanted to do, and that was all there is to it. It's down to me to see if I can persuade her to carry on. What's up? <sighs> sure. Just to feel for a bit. Yeah? And how are you feeling now? I'm feeling alright. I was just really upset with Howard and it again, I was upset so I just got angry about the whole thing. Happier? Yeah. No. It's a bit stressed. Yeah. We well, haven't eaten for a long time. I had a trick to <laughs> Did you? It's not really it's not really full of nutrition for a hike like this though. But you want to you want to continue? Yeah. In a decision that was unimaginable a week ago, Francesca pulls herself together and gets back on her feet. 
It's a huge relief. Nobody wanted to lose a second member of the team so close to the end. Francesca's on her way. Good. Good. We've had a chat. We're going to try and get some biscuits and things into her. But she wants to stay at the back. And I've said that I'm going to walk as she's agreed that I can stay within sight. I'll keep looking back so I can see her there. And um, I'll try and get to Chucky Keda. Well done. Come, come and join us. Come on. I've got some packaged orange biscuits You're here. You're welcome. They're really nice. Biscuits? <laughs> Sure? Yeah. Okay. Visibility is down to almost zero. As we walk, we think we hear the helicopter in the distance, but can't help wondering whether in this fog it will ever find Howard. You won't believe he's gone the other way. The helicopter seems to have disappeared again. It's incredibly worrying as we have no idea when or if it will come back. It was here, but it wasn't here. Uh, the helicopter, we thought, appeared above the mountains. It had turned round, it was about a mile away. Uh, we had a red marker to show where we were. Disappeared out of sight, the noise went, and uh, the facts are we're still stuck here on the mountain. Howard is still desperately dehydrated. It's vital that he gets to hospital today now getting on to uh, afternoon, uh, where we should be already back at uh, base, um, getting some attention from the doctor. So I'm a little bit unhappy about the whole situation at the moment. Still to come on the last leg of our journey to Chokikerao. Mark finds something nasty in the bushes. Don't move. And we take the last steps towards our destination. They're all so excited. Fantastic, fantastic. And of course, Mark, sometimes it is. But as we head higher and higher into hands. the mountains, the trail becomes more and more impenetrable, and we have to use machetes to hack our way through. Sometimes you've got some nasty bugs under the leaves, such as what we call the giant ant called Isula. It stinks really bad. Three of them can put you in a coma. So you have to be careful where you swing it. Otherwise, you can get them all over you. Up here, there's a surprise around every corner. Don't move. Uh. You got a little creature on you. And you don't want to touch it with your hands, because I won't either. Mm -hmm. They look quite nice, don't they? I'm guessing, though, that those hairs are probably uh, <laughs> not a good thing to come into contact with. Absolutely not. They're very toxic. And they actually burn if you touch them. It's like, uh, how can I compare it? Like, uh, after you have lit a match and touch it really hot, it wouldn't be nice to get one of these on your neck. <laughs> An hour later, we stumble across the first clue that we're finally getting oh, close to Choki Kerao. But can you see anything? Um, no, it looks a bit like just a little... F it's all there. Wood. It's completely it's overgrown, it's but Pepe has found us our first Inca ruin. This Inca home is centuries old. Wow. Imagine waking up to that every morning, though. Mm, awesome. With your coffee and your smoke. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, all the way here now, we haven't seen um, any of the kind of buildings. And this is, this is real, you know, living. This is how they used to live. As we get closer and closer to Choque Carao, Back down the mountain, the helicopter makes a third attempt to rescue Howard. Eventually, we heard the, the sound of, of the uh, propellers and we're looking and looking around the mountain and we don't know which way it's coming, which way it's flown in from, is it flying into the valley? And eventually, 
I heard it getting louder and louder and it appeared through the cloud and I knew that's it, we're going to be saved. And I knew it was only a matter of time before I would have collapsed another day under those extreme conditions the way I was. I'd have just passed out and suddenly this helicopter was giving me a chance to live again. It, it was that serious. I knew that once I get in it, I'm going to be made better. And it was a great feeling of elation, happiness, um, and also constantly thinking about my friends that were still walking for two more days and what they must be going through. Okay. Look at the cloud, look at the cloud going. As we round the final bend, there's a magical moment when the cloud clears and we get our first glimpse of the lost city. That, guys. <laughs> it's Chucky Canal. <laughs> <laughs> Already the city is working its magic. For the first time in the whole trip, Francesca happily takes the lead. On to Chucky Canal. The final push. Come on, guys, who's going first? Go on, Francesca. Go on. Go. Can you believe that we've been hiking all this way and we finally made it? <laughs> I can't believe it's actually there. <laughs> I was never going to make it. I didn't it. think we'd make this far, I have to say. Oh, they're all so excited. It's fantastic. Fantastic. It's taken us nine gruelling days to get here, trekking over the most extraordinary terrain Peru has to offer. We've had to cross rivers, ravines, and miles and miles of wilderness. The body can feel this already. We have another thousand meters to go. We've had to battle extreme weather and the ravages of altitude sickness to scale the highest peaks in the region. If my dad, God rest his soul, was alive today, he'd be very proud. We've risen to every challenge this journey's thrown at us. You can probably see the drop below is about a thousand feet, probably. And now we finally made it to Chucky Kedal. Wow, look at oh that. Oh my God. Amazing. Amazing. Huh? And the sun's come out for us. Oh, all I wanted. Beautiful. Oh wow, look God. at the Beautiful. buildings there. Beautiful. Big mountains. Shines come oh, out. God, it's beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Oh we have made it. Made it. Oh my god. It's the end of the line, guys. Well done. Give you a hug. Well Thanks. done. You well so done to you well. and all. Well done. Well done, you. Fantastic. Everyone. Yeah. Francesca, give you a hug. Well done. It did look quite amazing. I'm really glad I got that far because that, that's something that I'll always remember. It just, I would have done anything just to rewind time, just to see what that would have looked like. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it was easily worth the journey. I think it's, it's because so few people have come here. I think you always think of Machu Picchu as the big Inca ruin. And um, we're here alone, there's no one else here. It's just us. It's amazing. It's the amazing thing I've ever seen. It was just so perfectly built, this kind of Inca ruin. And to have got there and to have struggled through everything that we had gone through. It was just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it was just, I don't know how to describe the feeling. It was one of complete excitement and elation and just, can anything get any more spectacular? Very privileged, yeah, very privileged to be one of the chosen ones. Yeah, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm here. Just felt close to the gods up there and close to the Incas. It was a special place for them and, you know, it was a special place for me as well. Yeah, just awe-inspiring. Just down there, 
is the Condor. It's absolutely magnificent. It's got a wingspan of nearly three meters and it's just floating on the thermals down below us. Incredible. I've never seen a Condor before. <laughs> Shelley's overwhelmed. It is so... so emotional and... Like... I suppose it's just amazing. It makes you feel like... I don't know. A million dollars. Yeah, like you've just mm -hmm. given this whole new lease of life. For the single mum, this has been an emotional journey. More than anything, Shelley wanted this trip to kickstart her life and give her the confidence boost she needs to help her achieve her ambitions. Come to the other side of the world to Peru to, to um, push myself. And being on this trip has made me push myself. It's pushed myself to limits. I've um, experienced stuff that I would never experience stuff. And I know back at home there's loads of things I've got to change. I not realise that after the second day here, and the only person that can change it is me. Self-confessed control freak Mark was desperate for a chance to let his hair down and live life to the full. I have never really been a risk taker. This trip was a big thing for me to be able to do. Um, I've really had to sit back and let somebody else have the reins, and that's just so totally unlike me. On this trip, Mark has rolled with the punches, taken every day as it comes, and been a shoulder for everyone to cry on. Francesca's hyperactivity disorder has made it hard for her to work in a team, but in difficult and challenging conditions, she's made it to the end of this journey and made friends. Lots of times I didn't think I was going to make it this far. I'm glad I have. It's really beautiful, it's really calming, which for me is quite a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous. Fiercely independent Mia has thrived in Peru. She's come into her own away from the routine and domestic grind of three children and home. Mia wanted to break down her mental barriers and remind herself what it is to be free. I'm already kind of dreading getting back to the monotony of daily life. Because it, it's been the most sort of challenging, longest journey of my whole life, you know, a bit different to taking the kids to school, just 15 minutes down the road or whatever, you know. Just done nothing like this at all. People tend to sort of build brick walls for themselves to stop them doing things, you know, whereas I'm going to knock them brick walls down and feel I can do absolutely anything I want. Now we should show our gratitude. In true Inca tradition, the coca leaves come out once again, and Pepe helps us say thank you for getting us to the end of the journey. Thank you. Thank you. With all our heart. With all our heart. And all our soul. And all our soul. Apu. Apu. Sexy. Sexy. I learned a lot about myself on that trip. I learned that I'm a stronger person. I learned that I'm, I'm not scared of heights anymore. I learned that um, if I put my mind to something, I can really do it. I won't give up on the first hurdle. Like before, in things I'd say, oh, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, but I never really did it. Like I was always one of those people that needed a push. Um, but now, if I say I'm going to do something, I usually generally just get into it, because all I think about is, you walked up a mountainside in Peru, you can do this. Apu. Apu. Salcantay. Salcantay. I'm more confident. I don't really want to be sitting at home very often. I would like to be out doing things. I would like to be out challenging myself. Um, I would like to be out doing, trying new stuff. Um, it made me appreciate that there are loads of different places in this world. And I mean, the people in, it, that we met in Peru have very, very little and live in really very harsh circumstances. Um, and yet they live a completely fulfilling life. Pumasiyu. Pumasiyu. It's a massive achievement for me because it was so hard and it was so difficult, but I think everybody had that. I didn't take my medication while I was there and I was open about my disorder, which I'm not usually, I don't really tell anyone. Um, and I got on with everybody and I dealt with it as well as kind of this physical and feeling terrible and feeling ill and being knackered and soaking wet as well. So that bundles together. I never thought I'd be able to do that. So yeah, I think if I could do that, I'd pretty much do anything, can not I? Apu, Apu, Apurimak. Apu, Apurimak. 
I found the whole experience um, empowering overall, I guess, um, because I just felt that um, I could have gone on further and higher and for longer. I felt, you know, very well suited to that kind of life. I didn't have to adjust, I didn't suffer, and I feel more invincible and that I could really do anything. And I think, you know, its effects will be long lasting. Spirits. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you for being a fantastic team and getting here. And of course to Howard, not for getting here. Howard. Yeah. For Howard. 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 Experiences like this really can change you. The team have not only overcome their own obstacles, but the weather, the climate, illness. And I can't help but think that lots of them are going to go back changed people. Of course, it's a bittersweet ending because Howard never made it. But then I suppose that's what adventures are all about. You never know what's going to happen. This week we're trekking through the Andes Mountains of Peru in South America. Following a route that only a hundred people have travelled in the last century, we're trying to reach the amazing lost city of the Incas, Choquiquerao. This week's team are single mum Shelley Guilfoyle, who's got high hopes for this trip. I think it could change my life. I want it to change my life. Call centre worker Francesca Townsend, who wants to prove she can get on with other people. If I change what's going on, that's fine. <laughs> if other people change it, I don't like that. Perfectionist Mark Adams wants to let his hair down. I want more out of life. Why not challenge yourself? Why not take a few risks? 40-year-old Mia Newbury wants a chance to get away from the domestic grind. All these dreams and aspirations you might have had for yourself, kind of, you know, you lose it after a while. And the oldest member of the team, Howard Levy, wants to show he can keep up with the youngsters. I am 55 and I am reasonably fit. I don't smoke, I don't drink, so everything's going for me there. All five want to prove themselves on Extreme Dreams. Previously on Extreme Dreams, we're not even halfway through the journey to the lost city of the Incas, but already my team have been tested to their limits. We've had to cross the raging waters of the Udabamba River. It was a white knuckle ride for single mum Shelley, who's terrified of heights. Don't like none of that. Then we faced a long uphill hike into the wilderness, which was almost too much for Brighton girl Francesca. I can barely breathe. I can't do it. <laughs> and Yorkshireman Howard. Every time we turn a corner, there's another massive hill to climb. But we battled on against the rough terrain and ravages of altitude sickness to conquer a 5,000 metre mountain with the most extraordinary views. If my dad, God rest his soul, was alive today, he'd be very proud. But our ordeal wasn't over yet. Just don't look. The descent down the other side paralysed Shelley with fear. She's hysterical with fear right now. We're all scared. And later, we discovered one of the team was nowhere to be found. Mia! 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 Oh. Mia's been missing for over an hour now, and everyone's getting worried. We've made the gut-wrenching decision to move on from where we last saw her. We're desperately hoping she's at the spot where we're meant to meet our guide, Pepe. It was really irresponsible of Mia. There was a lot of other people there, and we were a team, and we were a family. And if she'd have been in our position, worrying about somebody, she'd have felt the same. And it was really a very upsetting time. Mia! Mia! We were kind of yelling and, and looking, but no response. And that's when the panic started setting in, and I thought, what the hell are we going to do? If, what happens if we do walk back to the camp and Mia's not there? We have just left her. And you couldn't help but think if she tripped or fell or were there animals that could do her any harm? All of those sorts of things came into play. I felt scared for her. Coming down through the rocks, we finally catch sight of her. 
Mia hasn't fallen into a ravine. She hasn't been attacked by wild animals. She's been doing a spot of bird watching. I thought we had to wander off alone and look for birds. Yeah, but I walk over here. Well, I think we've been sitting here for an hour. We've just well, been sitting waiting for you. Where did you go? I think we need to probably sit down and work out what we're going to do in this situation. Really? Please don't walk off again, because we were generally worried about you. I was really angry at her. At the time, I thought she was really irresponsible and I thought I just felt the whole attitude was a bit childish. First concern was your welfare. I've got yeah. nothing else. Worried to death about you. Even when we found her and told her what we thought, she wasn't that perturbed. In a strange forest with horrible insects and all sorts can go wrong, we were worried, you know, we're a team. You know what to expect. I'm a survivor. She couldn't see what all the fuss was about. She said, don't worry, she says, I'm a, I'm a survivor, I'm a loner. She is in your back garden but not in a strange place. And it, it, yes, that was one of the very worrying times of the trek. And how the hell would we have found you, to be quite honest? I'll sit there laughing. I'll we'll make some noise if there was any problems. Get All you have to trip. say is, look, I'm going ahead, don't panic. Yeah. If you don't find me, I know where we're going. I'll and explain to you the room, right. and, we'll and then you. it's clear. I don't worry about you, don't worry about me. Once again, Mia's broken one of the cardinal rules of trekking in the wilderness. You never leave the group, because if you do, you put everyone at risk. At this stage in our journey, a full-blown row could tear the group apart. Mia's defiant attitude just isn't building bridges, so I step in. How are you doing? You had everyone pretty worried there. Mm, seems I did. Yeah. yeah. Do you think they'd be that worried? No. I haven't got any inkling that, that they would be worried about me at all, no. Why not? Well, because I don't think we gel. I think we... It's the opposite of gel, grind. She, she's acting a bit like an irresponsible child, just walking off on her own, not telling her where she's going. Any decent adult would know that when you're in the middle of Peru, even you know where you are, you're going to tell someone where, you, where you're going. And I have no idea what snakes they have here, but to turn around and say I'd shout if I got bitten by one, I mean, what a ridiculous thing to say. So I suppose the big question is we've got quite a few more days we're, we're out trekking, you know, we're, we're probably about a quarter of the way there. What now? Yeah, I can't wait, you know. No, but in terms of the group. Oh. <laughs> um, well, yeah, this might bring us a little bit closer, you know. I understand that they um, care about me a bit more, you know. Do you think you can reciprocate that? Or we'll try to? Yeah, yeah. All right, come on. Should we go on, guys? Yep. yep. Am I forgiven? It's got been like... Just put it down to... Forget it, let's go You live and you learn. OK, let's go. We just have to move on, but tension in the group is still simmering. Understandably, I think everyone's a bit let down, really. They, they all came here as part of it. They wanted to form a group and, you know, get to, get to meet people they wouldn't necessarily normally meet. And, and Mia obviously has her very set ideas of what she wants from here, and it's independence. So you can probably see she's already way ahead of the group, even though Mark really wanted her to walk with us, but she's already steamed ahead, so... I don't know, it's not, not great at this early stage in the, in the trip, but it's something that, you know, we as a group, I suppose, have to, have to deal with. Better catch up. Don't want to be accused of running away. Today is day five of our journey to Chokikerao. We've got to cross eight miles of some of the most inhospitable terrain in the world to reach our next camp at Yanomar village. If we make it, we'll be halfway to our goal to find the lost city of the Incas. Pepe, our guide,'s been ahead to check the path. He's come back for us and he doesn't look happy. We will arrive to camp very late. I hope you have your, your flashlights, your torches with you. We have to keep on moving a little bit faster. All right. Yep. OK. Right, so seven miles to go. We'd better get on with it. Well done. Now on to that next one. Two hours later, and the steep terrain and blistering pace are really taking their toll on the group. We stop for yet another breather. This is a killer. This is worse than yesterday. All having breathing difficulties and everything. So now, I think we should just 
slow down. And Harold's really feeling it. I feel so sorry for him. You can't keep up with the others at all. I shouldn't try, Harold. Okay. That's why you've done yourself in. Luckily, Ben's carried all my gear. Otherwise, I don't know what I'd have done. Pepe predicted 10 o'clock tonight. I predict probably midnight at this rate. And, um, and I do fear that Howard's really, really feeling it. I'm actually a bit concerned about him, but which is why I'm always staying at the back, just keeping, keeping check. We struggle onwards, but the punishing terrain is pushing Howard to his limit. I've never done anything in my life as difficult for me as this. Balance was my biggest problem. And it bothered me intensely that I wasn't going to keep up the, 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 the pace. I couldn't do it quickly, just couldn't do it. The end of this pass is just up there. All his weight appeared to be on the sticks. Without the sticks, I'm not quite sure. You know, he just would have fallen straight forward, I'm sure. Have a little break, sit on that, a little sit on that wall. Just, just perch yourself on here. I think his knees are playing up, and I think that's the first time I fall to myself is how we're going to be right for the next day, next day of walking. Oh, this leg. Some water? Yeah, thanks. Just my knee that's... It's like putting a hot red poker on it. Although you can see somebody in trouble, you perhaps don't always appreciate just how much it's killing them to do something. It's an adventure. Oh. But I don't want to put myself through tremendous pain physically. Mentally, I'll do it, but... Well, you have to look it's... at the big picture as well, don't you? Yeah. We have many days left, so... That's right. I just don't want to get back... Well, I, wouldn't... I don't think I'd make it with this knee tonight. Mm -hmm. I really don't. It's... it's just like someone's putting a needle through it. One side of my heart, I was proud to be involved in such a wonderful expedition. The other side of me, how many days can I torture my body like this? It's obvious that Howard has reached crisis point. Something drastic has got to be done. I decide that the only way we're going to get to camp at all is to get Howard onto one of our emergency pack mules. When he got on the mule, I felt, I felt a bit sad, sorry for him, because he probably felt a bit... he let the group down. I know it's going to be hard on everybody, but after Howard, that must have been well out for him, especially because he's a man, especially because he was the first one out of the group to get put on a mule. With Howard on a mule, we finally pick up the pace and make it to camp as night falls. But the day has been tinged with sadness. For Howard, as a proud Yorkshireman, admitting he needed help was a bitter pill to swallow. This was my worst nightmare. The rest of the team performed superb and I've let them down, I feel. But I just couldn't go on any further. My knee was swelling up. How am I going to go on tomorrow? Uh, I only hope they'll understand that if I can't walk, just got to stop. But every cloud has a silver lining, and Howard's troubles seem to have finally united the rest of the team. You great, and I heard you earlier on saying that you'd let down the team, and really, we all just said a minute ago, we were like, I can't believe you just said that. You haven't let well, us no, down it, even it, a tiny bit. It's so frustrating, I know I'm quite a bit older, but when I see you walking ahead, not, and you're not going a fantastic... I can't keep up. <laughs> Look how most of the hours. Like, Why can't I? You turned up less than five smoke, minutes after. I don't really yeah. drink. I'm You've got to be the oldest like one on the team, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. I am, yeah, yeah, I'm 55, but I don't feel it. I've, fa I've found it hard on occasions, but I think more than physically, I've actually found it mentally. The willpower you need yeah. to yeah, keep yourself you've going. Yeah, you've had the now on the head. Harder than I actually it is, thought because sometimes be. you just want to sit down on a rock, didn't you? Just yeah, go, you think, yeah, well, I'm not a celebrity, up. but get me the hell out of yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the end of another eventful day out in the middle of Peru. We've been out for days now, and for the team behind me, things just seem to be getting harder rather than easier. We've had everything today, arguments, not to mention the uphill struggles and the long trek. Each person's strength and weakness is really starting to show now, but we still have a very, very long way ahead of us. Still to come on the fourth leg of our journey to find the lost city of the Incas. Horses provide welcome relief for Howard, but one man's rescue pony is another girl's nightmare ride. It's like I used to be scared of walking, and now I'm even more scared on top of a donkey. Howard faces a difficult decision. Got to weigh up the pros and cons. If I go back, at least I know I'm going to go back in one piece. And Francesca blows a fuse. Do please stop filming me. I will smash that at your face. 
Ahead of us today is a 3,000-foot climb up a precipitous trail carved through the cliffs of the San Juan Pass. It's another eight-hour trek over 12 kilometers, but the tiny path snakes round towering cliffs and has drops that are enough to make your head spin. Well, we've got a new stage of the trip now. We're going to get on horseback for a couple of hours because um, the terrain is very steep and um, we're running behind time a little bit. It's the first time I've seen Howard with a smile on his face for days. I grabbed it and put my arms round and nobody would have prized that horse away from me. And I never thought I'd be so happy to sit on a horse. That was a wonderful feeling. But for Shelley, who suffers from vertigo... I feel sick. Even sitting on the back of a donkey Just is an ordeal. Just trust your donkey. <laughs> I didn't even get given a meal, I got given a donkey. And it literally looked like the one out of Shrek. So I was like, oh my God. It's like I used to be scared of walking on the mountainside. Now I'm even more scared on top of a donkey, on top of the mountainside. I just feel sick all the time. I feel like I'm going to get a panic attack all the time. It's not like I control it. I feel like I'm not control, like I can't control things. Oh, I just feel really bad. Unfortunately for Shelley, this path is steep, high and incredibly narrow. And it's getting steeper, higher and narrower by the second. Oh, I can't do this today. I'm walking. Put your feet forward so you're resting oh, in your God, spirit. Oh, my God, I want to get off. It's all right. To make matters worse, the weather's closing in on us. Visibility is extremely poor, but you don't need to see it to know that inches away, the mountainside plunges thousands of feet down. You could die if you went one millimetre too far to the right. Um, and there were, you, did, you weren't going to survive. And let's face it, even if you survived and you were at the bottom with all your bones broken, you're going to have died by the time they get help to you because you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere. What a morning. This is what we call extreme horse riding. You can probably see the drop below is about a 1,000 feet, probably, and that's not even the, the depth of it. Over there, it's even further. We've dismounted the horses so that we can continue on foot until it's safe to get back on them. But um, we obviously have a very steep down to come, and I think all of the team are, are feeling pretty nervous about it all. I hate this. I'm so scared, and every day it just gets getting worse and worse for me. My, oh, just, this is just terrible. My foot got caught in a big, massive tree. My donkey shit off. My leg was caught back. Made all the other horses want to go faster. Then the steer got ripped off the donkey. And then on top of that, it's on, all on top of a mountainside. Anyone that has a, a fear of heights like she does, this is your worst nightmare. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not particularly worried about heights as I'm standing close to the edge, but I have to say there's been a few times when I've just, my heart has gone into my mouth and I've just thought, I can't believe we're doing this. I'll just walk here just so that... I'm not near the edge. Mm, I'm not near the edge, don't worry. Shelley's happier back on two feet, but for Howard, the pain he's feeling struggling over this rocky path is obvious. The situation with Howard is once again critical. We're almost halfway through our journey, and Pepe, our guide, knows that it's only going to get harder, not easier. We're in the point of no return. So uh, one way or another, he has to walk down. The horses are not going to be able to... Uh, to uh, carry him down because it is even dangerous for them to get down. Despite being in constant pain, Howard's determined to soldier on. I'm worried, yeah, of course I'm worried. I'm worried about my health and my knee. But to go back four days is just, it, no, I can't do that. In my heart and in my mind, I'm willing. It's my leg, but I've got to do it. To make matters worse, the never-ending rain has turned the path into a quagmire. That trail was so dangerous for everybody, let alone me, who was weak at the knees. The mud was like glue. You've no, no idea of the physical and mental torture. So just to let you know what Howard has ahead of him, see the little peak above the clouds there? That's what we have to cross. Thank <laughs> you.
The weather has deteriorated further, and with visibility down to just a few feet, we stop for a break. But for Howard, it's no longer a matter of a few minutes' rest. At this point, it just looked like his eyes were him, but everything else was just completely foreign, and it was just, he was pale and obviously absolutely, totally exhausted. It's clear to us all that Howard won't be able to keep going at this pace and in these conditions unaided. Now, my concern is for Howard. He went on a, one of the, the, the ponies yesterday, one of the horses. Yes. What, what are the chances of him continuing on one? Uh, no, no way. No way. It would be too dangerous. I was, you probably saw already a couple of mules falling off the trail. And uh, if he would be on a horse and that happens, I mean... Because be, the horses, would, they haven't actually fallen over, but they've lost their footing, and exactly. I suppose if there was someone on it, yes, that would yes. be us over the side. And what and about... Tomorrow is going to be the same. I and mean, the next day? I mean, no, so, so from no, here and on... And the next day. From here on until we reach Chokigirao's, it won't be possible to ride a horse. If he can, can't can really continue, uh, we wouldn't... We, we have to send him back. Hey, Howard. How are you doing? This is going to be devastating for Howard. Yeah. Perhaps the difficult news for you is that that is it, basically, for horses until we reach the ruins. Right. In the end, his choice is clear. He's either got to give in now and ride back to civilization, or keep going with us on foot. I really didn't know what to do. It was a terrible decision to have to make. It was almost a life and death decision. Pepe's warned me that we're still a long way from our next camp. The question is, can Howard keep going? So I've got to weigh up the pros and cons. If I go back, at least I know I'm going to go back in one piece. I have not enjoyed one little bit of the last 24 hours. Mm. It's just been absolute purgatory. It's not a pleasure to me. The no. scenery was, the company is, the whole the adventure. And I thought, but well, look at ill. You better to be ill with all of us and ill on your own, a donkey in the middle of nowhere. I think it was that day he said that if, if I was his daughter, he would have been proud of me. And I thought, that's like one of the nicest things that anyone's ever said to me. And I was like, you can't go now. <laughs> it's like, you've got to stay with us and finish it with us. And I, I was really upset that he was thinking about leaving. Because we're not going so far today, because I've yeah, been flooded. So yeah. maybe just go to that bit and see how you feel tomorrow. Yeah, but what you must remember is that for every down he goes, yeah, it's, 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 it's even further away from, from Cusco. Yeah. OK, we'll do it. Thank yeah. you for your concern. And we'll go for it. Okay. I'm wondering if it was worth it just for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brave decision, but I can't help feeling uneasy. Every step Howard makes takes him further away from civilization and medical help. But when the clouds suddenly lift, it all seems worth it. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. It is incredible. The land of the Incas is beautiful by daylight, but as darkness falls, the mountains seem much more threatening. We've already been walking for nine and a half hours, and there's still no sight of our next camp. <sighs> Treks and adventures really are about highs and lows. And boy, have the team had them today, both metaphorically and physically, from the highest peaks to these mud-strewn valleys that we're, we're trudging through now with thick, gloopy, smelly mud that's sticking to our bodies. The team have done fantastically well. Francesca, with her rucksack full of mini skirts, hasn't complained once. And Howard, who at one point looked like he was going to give up, has forged ahead. The team really have done well in what I would argue was a really, really difficult afternoon. And um, we're all looking forward to camp. Pepe has sent the mules and porters ahead to make camp, but his estimated 40 minute arrival time has been and gone, and there's still no sign of life ahead of us. Once again, visibility is becoming an issue on already perilous paths. The group start to separate out. Pepe and Mia are once again in the lead. I stay at the back to make sure Howard's OK, and Francesca, Mark and Shelley are somewhere in the middle. We're all looking for the elusive lights of our campsite and home. 
the road started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were like one foot in front of the other, otherwise you're going to go in. You had to make a conscious effort not to think about what was to your left, because in the dark, you weren't going to see branches, you weren't going to see anything to grab hold of. And we kept talking to each other about life, you know, family and things like that, to keep our minds off it. And at one point, the three of us said the Lord's Prayer. We all just started joining in. And that was a bit scary. There was loads of not really religious people start praying. You kind of think you're a little bit in trouble then. I think this isn't going to end very well. We trek in complete darkness for another two hours, and when we finally reach camp, tempers snap. That was such a thing to do. Please stop filming me. I will smash that out your face. As we'd approach the camp, your mood improves. You get better. And I think, really, the, um, the fact that we had got to camp, the relief that she must have felt, as well as the fear that she would have felt while we were walking, because we all did, I, I think it just... It was the only way she was going to get rid of it all, and, and she just totally, totally went for it. Stuck on the side of a mountain, it was dark, and I'd had such a dark... I'd been in my own little bubble all day anyway, and I just got really, really annoyed. I'm still quite stressed out now, actually. I probably won't sleep, I haven't eaten or anything. But, yeah, I haven't had a good day. And last to arrive into camp is Howard. At one point today, he nearly turned back, but bravely struggled on. Well done. Give me a hug. Thanks. Well for that, done. Man. Well done. You did brilliantly. It was down to you. No. Glad to see you alive. <sighs> Howard's uneasy on his feet, but at least there's a warm drink waiting for us. Thoughts on. And how is Francesca? No. Um, not impressed. <laughs> And that's probably being kind. <laughs> the bottom line is a trek and, a, 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 and an expedition is full of the unknown and you can't necessarily plan. When you're this far out in the wilderness, things can and do go wrong. The combination of losing Mia and Howard's physical battle have really taken their toll on the team today. It's been, a, it's been an incredibly long, long day for everyone and a pretty terrifying ending, really. You know, I've been on a lot of big trips in my life and that's... It's very few occasions when you're stuck up a mountain uh, with just a little torch, not really knowing where you're going. And we had that for many, many hours, so a very hairy ending, yeah.